Well, this morning, um, <laughs> we're going to read from Joshua chapter 2. And I, I think of this as a very, you know, talk about Rahab. And the, the um, title of my message is God Searching Out One. Kind of goes along with what we were studying last week with Luke chapter 15. But God Searching Out One, we're reading from Joshua chapter 2, verse beginning at verse 1. And Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent out from the Shittim two men as spies. Go, look over the land, check out Jericho. They left and arrived at the house of the harlot named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was, was told, We've just learned that men arrived tonight to spy out the land. They're from the people of Israel. The king of Jericho sent word to Rahab, Bring out the men who came to you to stay the night in your house. They're spies. They've come to spy out the whole country. The woman had taken the two men and hid them. She said, Yes, the two men did come to me, but I didn't know where they'd come from. At dark, when the gate was about to be shut, the men left. But I have no idea where they went. Hurry up. Chase them. You can still catch them. She had actually taken them up on the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax that were spread out on her roof. So the men sent uh, set chase down the Jordan Road toward the fords. As soon as they were gone, the gate was shut. Before the spies were down for the night, the woman came up to them on the roof and said, I know that God has given you the land. We're all afraid. Everyone in the country feels hopeless. We heard how God dried up the waters of the Red Sea before you uh, went before you when you left Egypt, and what He did to the Amorite kings east of Jordan, Shihon and Og, whom you put under the, a, hurl, a holy curse and destroyed. We heard it, and our hearts sank. We all had the wind knocked out of us, and all because of you, you and God, your God the God of the heavens above and the God of the earth below. Now, promise me by God, I showed you mercy, now show my family mercy and give me some tangible proof, a guarantee of life for my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, everyone connected with my family, save our souls from death. Our lives for yours, said the men, but don't tell anyone our business When God turns this land over to us, we'll do right by you in loyal mercy. She lowered them down out a window with a rope because her house was on the city wall to the outside. She told them, run for the hills so your pursuers won't find you. Hide out for three days and give your pursuers time to return. Then get on your way. Then, excuse me, the men told her, in order to keep this oath, You made us swear. Here is what you must do. Hang this red rope out of the window through which you let us down and gather your entire family with you in your house, father, mother, brothers, and sisters. Anyone who goes out the doors of your house into the street and is killed, it's his own fault. We aren't responsible. But for everyone within the house, we take full responsibility. If anyone lays a hand on one of them, it's our fault. But if you tell anyone of our business here, the oath you made us swear is canceled. We're no longer responsible. She said, if that's what you say, that's the way it is, and sent them off. They left, and she hung the red rope out the window. Rahab, (laughs) she's quite a lady, (laughs) and we're going to find out a little more about her as we go through this. But do you ever wonder why, Jericho, why Joshua would send spies back to Jericho? I mean, you know, 40 years prior, Joshua and Caleb are part of the 12 spies sent by Moses into the Promised Land. They come back with this, you know, with the report, and 10 of them said, we can't do it. <laughs> we can't take this land. They got walled cities. They got giants. They got all these problems and all this stuff. And, and we can't go in there. So God said, okay, take a trip. So they took a trip for 40 years. <laughs> Come back to the same place. Joshua now, Moses is dead. Joshua's in charge. He sends two spies into the land. 
Joshua, it, wasn't, it didn't work the last time. What makes you think it's going to work this time? You know? But he does. Because um, there's something greater, and this is, this is the kind, of, kind of the part that I look at with this um, five families and things that I want you to invite, I want you to pray about and write down their names, is that God has a plan, and sometimes we have to work the plan. And sometimes we don't know what the plan is, but we have to do the work to set it up. Now, why would you send spies into a city to spy it out when you're not going to go up against the city anyhow? You know, it isn't like find out where the weak spot of the wall is and that's where we're going to attack. You know, find out wh- how we can sneak in through the drainage ditches and, you know, up through, the, up through the sewer system, get inside the wall and go in and unlock the gates and we can, everybody, all the people can charge in at night and we can take the city. No. Just go in there and spy it out. Well, he sent the spies into the city and uh, he sent the spies and they were to report back to him not to the congregation. Well, in the city, the two spies, by the providence of God, found an inn on the wall, and the lady who ran the inn was Rahab the harlot. Now, what are the chances that these two spies are going to find the only person in town in the whole city that wants to believe or does believe in the God of the people of Israel. I mean, what are the chances? What are the chances that these two guys who are going into the city, and you know what, if they had checked her out and her credentials, they wouldn't have gone there. (laughs) Why? Because she's a harlot. I mean, she's known as a, a prostitute in her community, and she runs the inn. And the inn is where all of the travelers who are caravans are coming into the, the city of Jericho. They come in and, you know, they have to look for a place to stay and they stay at her house or her inn. So here we are, um, the greatness of sin that she is experiencing in her life is no barrier to the pardoning mercies of God. Our sin is never a barrier to the mercy of God just like the disciples, just like Jesus washing their feet. Our, what we have done wrong, what we will do wrong, doesn't interrupt God touching our life now. I mean, that's, that's just such an overwhelming perspective. I mean, you talk about having hope. We have hope in any hopeless situation because God is there. God is with us. And there are many before their conversions... <laughs> They were, they were pretty wicked people. But God knows the heart. He knows what's going on. He, does, he looks beyond the wickedness. He looks, looks beyond the things that, are, that we would look at and say, you know, just like in Luke chapter 15 that we, when we looked at last week, the Pharisees, Jesus, what are you doing with all of these sinners? And Jesus tells them the, the three stories from last week. So, There was one person in all of Jericho, one person in all of Jericho that believed in the God of Israel, and her name was Rahab. Divine provision, divine provision brought the spies to her inn. And there she told how the fear of Israel, the God of Israel, has come over the city. And Rahab heard of this God by way of the travelers and by those who believed that the God of Israel was able to take this city and everything because the people of Israel had done such, such miraculous things. They had done such extraordinary things uh, and, and their deliverance from Egypt and their survival in the desert and their coming now uh, to take over Jericho. And the people were afraid. And Rahab, she was pretty clever and wise, you know. She was, she was a pretty intelligent woman because 
She saw the judgment coming upon the, the city of Jericho, and she looked for a plan of escape from this whole situation. And when the plan presented itself, she was ready. <laughs> it's like the missionaries. You, there were some missionaries years ago that uh, went to Chinese to study the Chinese language. And they, they went there to study the Chinese language because God spoke to their heart and told them, China's going to open up for missions, and I want you to be ready, the first ones ready to go in. And these people went like two years, three years ahead of time to learn the Chinese language. And sure enough, there was the, the, the barriers were let down. They were the first ones in because they were ready. There's, in our hearts, there is this thing that God does. It's like, you know what? There's nothing around me, nothing here that says, this is how it's going to work. But in my heart, I think, I believe that something's coming. I believe that it's going to work. Now, <laughs> I don't know if you noticed <laughs> um, in communion today, I filled up all the trays. You know, I fill them all up. Do you ever want to know why I do that? Because <laughs> I believe someday they're all going to be empty. You can say amen. <laughs> I believe that some communion Sunday, all of these are going to be empty. Why? Because there's a purpose for us being here, and the purpose of our serving God is greater than just me doing what I'm doing now. And it wouldn't matter if we had a 1,000. We'd be still believing that God would have 2,000 or 1,500. If we have 50, we, we want to go for 75. We have 75, we want to go for 100. Why? Because there is a progression of what God wants to do, not only in growing us, but in growing us, he helps us touch the lives of others. And so what we're doing is we're preparing for something. We're preparing for something that we can't see. That's called faith. The Bible talks about hope. We have the blessed hope of Jesus coming back. The hope of Christ's return is Jesus is coming back. It's a definite time out in the future in which he is coming back. We just haven't got there yet. So God allows us to understand, see things, and, and you know, it's like we know something's going to happen. Now, I don't, I don't go for the... Uh, I know something bad is going to happen, and sure enough, it will. <laughs> you know, give me a break. You know, there, if you look long enough, you know, it's like anybody else said, if you look long enough, you can find what you're looking for. <laughs> if you look long enough, you can find what you're looking for. Why? Because we have faith to believe. We have faith to believe for a certain thing. Our faith just happens to believe that we got one foot in the grave and one on a banana peel, and sooner or later we're going to fall in. Guess what? You're right. <laughs> You're right. It is going to get worse. But I believe it's going to get better. Well, what happens if it gets worse? It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it gets worse. It know, but I know something good is going to happen. I believe. And you see, our belief is our motivation, our desire that we're preparing for the opportunity and when it arises we got it rahab has been preparing knowing that these people that have been wandering the wilderness when they show up here i'm out of this place i'm not hanging on i'm getting out of here and what happens is joshua sends two spies into the city what man in his right mind is going to send two two spies into a city when he's not even going to go into the city but there's two spies that need to go into the city because they need to find this inn in which there is this lady called Rahab who is a harlot. Let's go, here's one for you. Let's go seek out the prostitute's house and stay there tonight. <laughs> you know? Don't let anybody see you going in that house. <laughs> you know, what's going to go on? You know, everybody's going, but you see, this is what happened with the two spies. They went to this lady, and you know what? 
we find that these two spies went into there and she risked her life to preserve them. She hid them under the flax on the roof. And so here they are, they're there, and she knows, the king knows these guys are there. <laughs> Did you ever see somebody walking down the streets of Wimber and you know? They just don't. You know what? They're not from here. <laughs> huh? They're not from here. Where are they from? I don't know. They may be from Johnstown. They may be from New York City. But they're not from here. If you go to some city, someplace else out of this area, you know, down in, you know, Georgia, <laughs> and you start talking to people down there, what's going to happen? You're not from here, are you? Nah. Young's people don't take care of us too well, you know. <laughs> We're going downtown Johnstown. <laughs> young's, young's, young's not from here, are you? That's what we would say to them, you know. And they'd just say, well, you don't, but you don't, well, the children of these two Israelites, these two Jewish people walk into the city. Everybody knows those two aren't from here. I bet they're part of that band across the river. So I've been to Jericho. I've been to Jericho. Been stood on the tell, the place where they think perhaps the uh, walls of Jericho stood. And Jericho is some 6,000 years old when the children of Israel show up. So this is an ancient city. Well, how do you know it's the same place? This is a desert area, and there's water in Jericho. There's water in Jericho for some 8,000 years. There have been, there's been water coming out of the cistern that's at Jericho. And where there's water, there's a city. <laughs> And where there's a city, there's gates and there's walls. And so Jericho is a walled city that has been there for now some 8,000 years. The same well is producing water that was running water when Joshua shows up with the armies of Israel. Rahab (coughs) ran the inn, the hotel of sorts, and she was a well-informed woman because she knew everything. She knew everything that was going on in the city, and she knew everything that was going on outside of the city. And all the caravans, the caravans would come through, and there, the men would come to, their, to stay at her hotel. Men from all over the east brought news of these, and it's called swarms of people. <laughs> now there's a million to five million people, the Jewish people, that are wandering the wilderness. They, the... the people of, of Jericho and that region. It's hard enough for a band of 20, 50, 100 at the max to find and sustain life out in the desert. We have in the children of Israel a million to five million people walking the desert. Everybody knows where they're at. All the caravans know where they're at. They know where these people are at and what's going on. And they had heard of the miraculous stories about the exploits of the children of Israel, how that God brought them out of Egypt, brought them through the the Red Sea. And you know what? (laughs) This is a Dave McGee interpretation. The caravans and the treasure hunters would have known where the armies of Egypt were swarmed under, washed under in the, uh, when the, you know, they came through on dry land and then the waters came in and killed all the Egyptians. How would you know? What happens when a ship goes down? <laughs> what are we looking for with that plane that went down in the, uh, in the ocean? We're looking for the things that surface. <laughs> well, how many years later do things wash up? Wash, that's a, <laughs> our own colloquialism. How many washed up, huh? (laughs) So how many things come from the, you know, that have been under the waters for a while, wash up up on the shores? They would have been picking these things up. They would be retelling the stories of what had happened and how that the children of Israel had gone through the Red Sea and how that God had provided for them. And these travelers would collect this information and and translate it and talk about it in the cities. And... um, These people would have been coming into Rahab's place 
to stay her establishment. So the people of Jericho now are very much aware of the impossibilities of how this large group of people have survived in this promised land. Well, how that they had gone to battle and won against these two kings. So the rumors have it that the people, that Rahab uh, was following their journey. She was well aware of what had taken place. Her faith came by hearing what God had done in the lives in the nation of Israel. Joshua, the son of Nun, is now the leader of Israel. Uh, We find where Joshua had come to this city before, came back with a we-can-do-it attitude, and he was postponed for 40 years, and now he's back to take the city. The land was promised to them, and Joshua sent these two spies to find the secrets of the cities. And while the two spies found their way to Rahab's inn. Well, if you're going to spy out a city and you you don't want to be caught, God has to provide for you, especially when you stick out like a sore thumb. (laughs) And... uh, your, your dress and your manner is different than any traveler that comes through, the, comes through the gates. They knew immediately these two were spies from that bunch across the river. You got a million people. And so at Jericho, you can stand there, up, kind of up, almost against the hillside. The, one, the back wall would have been against the, the mountain. And you can look across, and you can see clear across the valley, which is probably... Uh, maybe 30 miles or whatever, 20 miles across. And in the middle of this valley is the Jordan River. The Jordan River is not as big as Paint Creek here. (laughs) All right? But in flood time, flood time, it's very flat. And so the creek is, if you, whenever we were up at uh, the Sea of Galilee, we were on the bus, the bus stopped in the front end of the bus in the back end of the bus, span the Jordan River. <laughs> That's how big it is. It's not very big. But it's not very deep either. It's maybe about three or four feet deep. In the flood season, the Jordan River is the water that comes from Dan, Jordan River, the waters that come from Dan, which is the northern tribes, which is the mountain peaks. And in the mountain peaks, when the snows melt, All that water comes down and there's no place for it to go, so it overflows and floods the entire region. So, you know, it can be maybe a mile across. It's all flooded and swamped, and that's kind of how they fertilize the valley. The silt and the water from the north comes down and goes across there, and that's that's where their water is. So here they are. There's a million people across the water, across the uh, valley, a million people. So you're standing on the walls of your city looking out across this water and on the other side of the water there's a million people. At least a million people. And all you got to defend yourself is these walls. Well, Rahab decided, you know what? I'm siding with them and their God. When the king wanted the spies, she... No, she hid them. And then she told the two spies this. I know that the Lord has given this land to you. (laughs) Now, who's been preaching to her? Who's been telling her, Rahab, you know what? You need to quit your sinning and you need to give your life to God and you need to get out of the city and go join up with the Israelites. Nobody's been preaching to her. She knew in her heart she needed to go with the God of the Israelites. She says, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen upon us. The Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Your God is the God that is greater than all the ones that we serve. Please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to me and my family. Because I have shown kindness to you, give me a sign 
that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. She was ready. Those spies were in. They came in the evening, and they, and they, and they, and, uh, they were going out before, you know, before morning. She had a plan in her heart that if something happens, I'm out of here, and she was ready for it. And when they showed up, she had a plan, and she presented it. She kept them. She knew something was going on. Rahab, a remarkable statement of faith. All because she heard about the things of God. And that's where you and I, you know, these five families, these individuals, families, groups, there are people who are waiting on the walls, living in whatever condition they are in their life, waiting for you for an invitation. Now, we don't know what's going on in their mind because God does. God has presented and put into the hearts of people they've got to change. From whatever, for whatever reason, for whatever thing, whether they've ever, you know, we're not talking about how bad people are. We're talking about God being able to look at the disciples and wash their feet, knowing they're all going to walk away. But Jesus knew what they needed before they knew it. And that's what I think God would put on our heart. There are people, he has been working on their hearts, working on their lives, and they know they need a change. And God's going to give you their name. And you know what? They may not come this, this Easter. They may come next Easter. <laughs> they may not come this week or next week. They may come the week after. We don't know. But the invitation is there. And, and Rahab, what does she do? She lowered them out the back on a scarlet cord. And they were instructed then to, she was instructed to tie that cord to the window and that when the children of Israel came, that they would all be safe. You know, when the children of Israel left Egypt, they passed through the Red Sea. And now when passing over Jordan in the flood season, they walked through on dry ground. Now, this wasn't a big body of water that was, you know, 20 feet deep or something. This was the Jordan River that was mud and mucky and, and whatever, perhaps a mile across and maybe two, or two feet deep, maybe. It was just flooded. And when, the, when Joshua and the children of Israel were going to go across to take Jericho, the ark, the presence of God, went before them. They, they stepped in the water and the water stopped and the people, a million people, walked through on dry ground. They got to the other side. <laughs> now, Rahab doesn't know the plan. So, can you imagine? She's got her red cord out the window. She's got her family in the house. Everybody she's supposed to save. And they got him in the house. And she's ready. The people do a march around the city. And nothing happens. Rahab, you're nuts. Side with those people? You're nuts. Day two. Walk around the city, nothing happens. Day three, nothing happens. Four, five, six, seven. Seventh day, they walk around seven times. Can you imagine how her family is telling her, you know what, you sided with the wrong people. We're out of here. And those who didn't stick with Rahab left, and they would have died for their decision. But those who stayed with her and her decision found safety when disaster struck. Now, So when the problem came, when the walls came tumbling down, Rahab and those she loved were spared. Her faith saved her, and not only her, but they saved her family and her entire household. Jericho's end reminds us of Sodom and Gomorrah, where God saved Lot and his wife and family. He saves Rahab and her family. And do you know what's really fantastic about this whole story in hebrews chapter 11 verse 30 and 31 it says by faith the israelites marched around the walls of jericho for seven days and the walls fell flat by an act of faith rahab the jericho harlot 
Welcome to spies and escape the destruction that came on those who refuse to trust God. Not only that, Rahab is in the family lineage of King David, who is the lineage of Jesus Christ. You see, an act of faith, God, do, God has a way of moving in people's lives to change them. We see God's grace has no boundaries. The red cord that hung out of Rahab's house reminds us that uh, we are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as wool. That was Isaiah. So Rahab's story is a lot like Luke chapter 15 last week when the Pharisees are coming against Jesus and saying, you know what, you, what are you doing spending all this time with sinners? What does Jesus tell them? Tells them about the lost sheep. Ninety-nine are safe, but there's one that goes out to get, he goes and gets the one. Ten coins, one is lost, scours the whole house looking for it, has a great celebration when she finds it. The lost son, the prodigal son who runs off and he gets wasted, <laughs> All of his living and everything, he gets wasted and comes back home. The father's looking for him. This is the story of God looking for the one. An entire city, and God is looking for the one that in her heart is different than everyone else. And what we're doing in our lives, we recognize that God has blessed us. He has given us many blessings in our lives. But you know what? There are still people that are the one that are waiting in their heart to find that place where God is speaking to them. And this is our opportunity to be the one who goes in and finds them. You see, God chose a stutterer <laughs> to speak for him. His name was Moses. He found an infertile woman to be, the mother, to be the mother of a nation. Her name was Sarah. He found possibly the most weakest, less, least influential person to save Israel and defend him. It was Gideon. He took a forgetful, a forgettable youngster the son that was left and forgotten about made him king, and that was David. Took an unknown young woman, made her the mother of his son, that was Mary. And he took a persecutor that was <laughs> ravaging the church, turned him into a great evangelist to take the gospel to the nations, and that was Paul. He sent two spies into a city to find a harlot whose heart was ready to receive him. God uses ordinary people to reach ordinary people who need God. That's us. Amen? Let's stand, shall we? So as you think about Easter Sunday, five families... What I thought was, everybody, you know, kids, every, young people, and whatever, write out five people and then get together and with mom, dad, and others and say, what five did you have? <laughs> what five, who did you think of? And combine them together and make it five. Seven, ten. I don't mind if you use ten. But, you know, make it five and just invite them. You don't have to twist their arm. You know, you know, I have to say, you better, come to, you better come to church or else. You know, the walls are going to come down. You're all going to die. <laughs> you know, what's going to happen? You're all going to go to hell. It's not going to be my fault. <laughs> you know, I think that, well, some people need saved any way you can look at it. But God will direct us. And think, of, you know, I think of this story with Rahab, how that, you know, it's just impossible you have a whole city. How, how probable is it that these two spies who don't know what they're doing, 
don't know where they're going, walk into a city, uh, stick out like a sore thumb, go to the only place in town, the only, the only place in town that would save them and keep them safe from the soldiers that would want to kill them. And God takes them right to this harlot's house, this innkeeper. And there they find security and rescue her and her family, her lineage is in the lineage of Christ. What are the chances? God has that same thing for us. Father, thank you for your blessing. Thank you for how you watch over us. And God, you have come into our life and you've made us a very special person, the person we were intended to be. You change us from the inside out. God, you are so good to us. You look beyond our faults. You see the needs. You touch our lives with your grace and your mercy. You restore us. You bless us. God, we are just thankful to you for all the great things you've done for us and what you will do in our lives. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you.